and Katie have come to join us today to talk about returning to work post lockdown, post COVID, post everything that's gone on in the last 12, well, slightly over 12 months now. So I'll let both of them say hello to you. Katie, do you want to go first? Yeah, thanks so much for having me on, Mel. Um, I'm Katie, as Mel said. Um, yeah, really delighted to be here today. Thank you. Uh, and Rab? Hi, Rab. I'm Rab. Um, again, really, really excited to be on today. And thanks for uh, thanks for giving the opportunity. I think it's be a, a good topic and a very uh, topic that hits home as well. Thank you. And so, so we've all had very, very different experiences of lockdown, I'm sure. Um, some have been really, really good. Some have been not so good and some have been really, really significantly bad. So we've got people in lots of uh, different positions going back into life as, as the new normal. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about is that, you know, we're not the same people that, that we were a year ago. Uh, have you guys noticed that in your environment? Absolutely. And I think it's just been such a change for people on and to have gone through that level of whether it was insecurity for people or whether it was um, not knowing how this would last or how it would play out or um, actual health issues. I think, I mean, I've noticed it amongst the people that I work with, amongst myself, my family, my kids um, and my wider circle. I think I, I think that's a really good articulation, Mel, that we're we're just not the same people that we were before. Um, how about you, Rab? Have you found that? Yeah, absolutely the same. I, mean, I think what's happened is what could have been you know, a month out or whatever, you make an adjustment. I think what I've seen in people I've talked to and, and worked with, and it's changed their philosophy on, on work. And I think that's a big difference. Yeah. And, and, and actually, um, so, so Rab, for you in your background, you, you work in more IT environments. So, so you've been perhaps a little more used to working behind a screen than Katie and I have? Um, I think somewhat, but I think one of the challenges, if we go back to the beginning of the pandemic, I think one of the things that we were suddenly very much in the center. I mean, IT has always been about remote working, making enabling technologies for people to, to better work wherever. But at the beginning of the pandemic, March, about a year ago, just over a year ago, it was suddenly IT was thrust in the middle going, we all now have to work from home. So, you know, from that perspective, it was good, but it was a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on our, on our teams that may not be big enough. Gosh, yeah, I must have put huge resource under it in a, in a very quick time, just trying to suddenly turn things around. And I suppose everyone's turned their business around in lots of different ways. I know B4 has turned their um, working model around differently. And, and Katie, you've had lots of experiences of different things going on in, the, in this year. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, it's changed a lot. You know, I really reassessed what mattered. Um, I struggled with, I've got three kids, I struggled with homeschooling, that kind of made for quite a lot of tension. We've got really little ones who are trying to do both me and my husband and whose work was more important each day and who had to, you know, help the kids and all of that. That was that was quite difficult. But I even through all of that, I still reflect that I probably had it easy in that um, if I think about other people, I know I was on a call actually just this morning with somebody who worked for one of the big family holiday companies and she was just talking about the trauma for people that work there who didn't know whether they were going to have a job they didn't know uh, you know the, they started off on reduced pay then it became furlough but they didn't know whether they'd ever come back they were getting death threats from people I mean it was just oh, it was kind of, yeah really really oh. significant people well people have booked weddings haven't they and they couldn't process refunds and order quickly enough and all that sort of stuff so I mean, she, the word she used was trauma. And then, and I've talked to you guys before about someone else now who's um, a nurse in the NHS who was on the front line. And he, he talks about having to, um, to really think about how you kind of come to terms with what you've been through and what you've seen. So I feel really lucky that um, it didn't affect us that badly. But then from my own mental health, you know, it was, it was challenging. It was sort of, mm. I think a lot of people talk about first lockdown, second lockdown, third lockdown. First lockdown was kind of a little bit exciting and the sun was shining and it was a little bit oh, yeah. unusual. By the third, it was, it was hard to put one foot in front of the next, I think. And, and it, was, it was a lot more of a struggle in January in the wet and the dark than it had been before. So I think, um, yeah, I think we, we were all impacted in different ways. And one of the things that I've definitely found is that um, the, the, the sort of reactions that the body can have under different stress circumstances and stress is a very complex subject, obviously, but 
one of the one of the things that can go on is as we get more and more stressed we get this sort of fight or flight response that goes on inside us but traditionally in, in the ancient days when we lived out in the forest and had saber-toothed tigers ch chasing us that that response was designed to give us a lot of sugar and energy and adrenaline to, to run off and and to have that energy to run away but we're not actually running anywhere so that becomes very physically damaging if you're constantly getting stressed but you can't go out anywhere or do anything with it so people are actually starting to have physical symptoms of the stress the, the ongoing stress that the change in lifestyle has had for them which is is really quite scary in in many ways yeah agree i have a cold sore like your body kind of tends to give away the clues you know it's like you think you you think you can keep running and keep running but eventually it starts to starts to show up i think yeah and, and, and goes on and affects the sort of things like blood pressure um and all sorts of physical symptoms and pain levels and your ability to absorb and cope and and uh, understand people's perspectives. They, all the tolerance levels go down a bit. Sorry, Rab, you were going to say something. No, I was going to add to that. I, mean, I think you're right. I think they also affect different people in different ways. I mean, we had a, um, a quite young workforce who were sort of on a help desk environment and they were locked, literally locked in in a one bedroom flat. And some of the conversations that I remember having with people like, you know, that team and trying to keep them going, it was that I feel like in isolation. I just feel like I've got no contact. And I think that really does affect people from, you know, whether you're, you know, Katie was talking about family life, which is really, really busy. And trust me, I know how that feels, got a young grandson. But the other end of that scale is completely feeling totally isolated. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the responsibilities that you have at home become very isolated as well. So whether it's parenting and homeschooling, you, certainly to begin with, I imagine, I didn't do homeschooling, but um, thankfully my kids were older, I could let them school themselves at university and stuff and do that. But I guess, Katie, in, in your environment, you had to sort of suddenly learn that very much on your own at first, although I know more support came out later, but at first it was really on your own. And and I had I look after my mum who's got Alzheimer's and she's found it really difficult to understand the concept of a pandemic and COVID. And she can't remember why people aren't coming around and she can't remember why she can't go out. So it's really and you, you have to work with that all on your own, really, or you feel you do. I think from our perspective, the um, certainly my so the kids, the grandparents, I think that was a huge struggle. I mean, they're not in particularly good health and very cognizant of how many years they may or may not have left and a year of not seeing your grandchildren is a huge huge thing um so I I, I agree with Rab you know it's the, it's actually all ends of the spectrum you know young and I had to, I had people in my team that were in one bedroom flats that were climbing the walls and really people's behavior just sort of started to change a little bit like feeling really insecure really edgy losing confidence etc yeah. and so you, you have that end of the spectrum and then you have the elderly end of the spectrum and then everything else in between. And I think one of the big lessons of lockdown, certainly for me, has been we're all just kind of as fragile as each other in many ways. And we're all going through our own stuff and it, it, any sort of pressure on the valve can make you kind of behave differently. So homeschooling, I mean, geez, that brought out the absolute worst in me when, when, the, when there were moments when like, it's all funny and people always put like it on Facebook or whatever, but it was really stressful. So you're, you, you've got a deadline and you've got people needing things of you and you've got to, you've got to show up and lead a team. Mm -hmm. And then you've got two little people that are, you know, needing your help and needing your time and needing your patience. And that's in really short supply. And I'd lose it sometimes and be screaming like, you know, why can't you get this or whatever. And the <laughs> rational bit of my brain would know that that's not helpful and not going to help them learn. But it was almost like my reserves were all used up. There was nothing, <laughs> there was nothing left. So and then in the evening, what that then happened was when my husband and I would actually sit down at the end of the day and we were exhausted and broken, <laughs> we wine. And so then, then the whole thing would start again the next day. So got into some really unhealthy habits, I think, over lockdown. Yeah, Rob, I can see you chuckling away there. What were your unhealthy habits? <laughs> oh, no, I'm just commenting on that. I'll come back to that another time, maybe. Um, <laughs> but I was just actually mindful of the fact that when you talk about um, grandparents, I am a grandparent, my um, second grandson was born for my daughter during the COVID period. And I think I can count on two hands the amount of times we saw it, right? So as it opened up again, we go meeting in the park, we're strangers to him. And that, you know, I think one of the things 
I've seen is you can appear and sound confident when you've got anxiety. Everyone's got anxiety. And I think that's very important as people, um, you know, think about return to work, thinking about going back into the social environment. It, it, you've got to read under, you know, you'll be able to pick up the body cues again, which you can't do on, on video. Yeah. Yeah. And it is much harder on video. And I know, Rab, you, you and I were speaking um, last week about the fact that the sensory world that we've lived in for the last year has been incredibly different. And I know, Katie, you, you've got an experience of this. But it, prior to COVID, we were used to a very almost overloaded sensory world that we lived in, full of noise, full of light, full of people, full of vehicles, full of smoke, full of all sorts of different things, good and bad. But it was it was a bombardment really every day that was coming in and we've got used to that and it's gone really quiet now in you know when you're at home and there's not all of that stuff going on there's not phones beeping everywhere and phones ringing in a busy shared office space and all sorts of different things like that and you don't really notice that it's gone away or actually no to be fair I think I did notice it had gone away a lot I did I did feel quite different and in some senses at first I think I felt I had more space in my head to think about things but then also it felt different. I'm not sure I completely liked it long term, but going back now, it can be quite overwhelming. And Rab, you, you, you and I were talking about the fact that you, I think you said it, we've gone down from five senses to two. Yeah, so if you think, I mean, it was one of the great thing about um, Zoom or video conferencing around that perspective is everything, everyone's equal. Now, I, you know, people I talk to, I actually have to ask them, how tall are you? I'm not seen you before. Right, and it's like because yeah, everyone's the same height. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so make sure when I meet you, I'm looking up or down. I don't anyway. Um, so it, it is about um, using to your senses. I mean, one of the things you realise, and I soon realised, um, was you know you can pick up a cue where someone is sort of looking a bit anxious, and you can pick, but you can't do it in this two dimensional view of people. Yeah. It's so different. Yeah, it's very- no, I've did some. I've had some really intimate conversations on Zoom where. The, Sorry, we are talking about the right meeting here, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But really kind of where you get into a really a level of kind of intimacy where you're you're actually a lot closer to somebody sometimes than physically than you would be if you were sitting in a room with them. And it sometimes lends itself to some really great conversations where I feel like there's an element, somebody said it to me the other day, of like just knowing that you can shut the screen. Like um, you know, we've we've never met in person, the three of us. No. I mean, I'm, you know it, it's like this sort of level of I can actually share what I want because we, I don't know I can't quite describe it that you can just shut the screen at any point so I think there have been pros and cons I was just going to add on your point actually Mel on um, the stimulation the noise stimulation so we walked we went to soft play yesterday which um, mm-hmm. is just like I mean my goodness it's just the <laughs> screeching and the noise can't really be replicated <laughs> remember it well <laughs> Yeah, but the kids, they didn't know where to go when they walked in. They didn't know, like, it was such a, you know, we always think about it for us, but for them, it was this whole sort of, oh my gosh, like, I don't I don't know what all this noise is and, and where to go. And it was really, particularly my middle boy, it was really intimidating for him. He just wanted to stay next to me and the little one needed his dad with him and all the rest of it. So, I think it, I think this overstimulation and I want to hold on to some of that. I want to hold on to some of that quiet and that peace. I was sort of sitting yeah. there thinking, feeling on edge and not not really enjoying it. Whereas before it would have been a great excuse to get out and get the kids entertained while I have a coffee. Um, whereas actually it wasn't relaxing in the slightest, that noise. It is interesting, isn't it? How, how we've changed our perspectives of things because we've changed. Um, and, and I think one of the things I've noticed is I, I was a very busy, reactive person before. Um, and now I'm not like that. I'm, I'm much more thoughtful. I'm much more proactive. And I've got more space and time to think. I still don't think about things properly, but I've got more time to do it, and more time to procrastinate because I'm very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know when I, I was um, shielding and when I um, first went out, I was absolutely terrified. I have never felt agoraphobic. I've never understood what that was about until that point. And I started to go out the front of the house and and it was weird because I hadn't been forwards out the house for so long. I'd only been backwards into the garden or inside the house. I didn't realize ivy had grown all over the roof because I couldn't see it because I didn't go out. So it was really weird. But I think also I find it very, very overwhelming. And I think that's something that perhaps as people do go back to work, 
we all need to be a little bit mindful and compassionate about is that people will be at different stages, won't they, of where they are in their own emotional well-being and their ability to suddenly cope with what we used to live. And, and it will take a bit of time. Yeah, and who knows if it will ever go right back to how it was. Mm. So I think I said to, said to you on a um, call we had the other day, Mal, when I went into London for a meeting, and I'm normally very socially confident, um, don't always feel like that inside, but I'm normally fine talking, I can normally find common ground with somebody enough to kind of break the ice or whatever. And I went into London, drove into London, and I was completely overwhelmed by the noise, the new social etiquette of, you know, do you shake someone's hand, do you elbow them, do you fist yeah. bump, do you, you know, what do you do? Um, that even ordering a coffee in Cafe Nero, I felt incredibly self-conscious about I'm wearing a mask, we're not wearing a mask. Do I do hand sanitizer? What do I, you know, it, there was, it was like a whole new set of things to think about. And I felt inherently very shy and it was such a, a different feeling for me. And Mm. It was a very helpful feeling because it kind of made me realize that the things I take for granted are, are just habit it's not actually me it's um it's just I'm in the habit of walking around and knowing what to do in all of these situations but it was scary how quickly a shyness could come over you the minute that you were out of practice on that so that whole social side um so yeah I'll, I'm, and I want to remember that I don't want to just forget that I want to remember that and, and not take it for granted again and build back from there rather than necessarily rush back to that person that could run around and multitask and grab a coffee and talk to someone and you know actually maybe this is a more comfortable situation in many ways yeah and I think that there's definitely something about there's been good and bad in that year experience so there is something about acknowledging that we're all different to the person that was last you know I haven't been well I've actually left the work where I where I used to work but if I was going back I wouldn't have been there for a year and walking into that environment would be very very different and I would not be that same person and I wouldn't have the same reaction so being mindful of that and and, and um, reminding ourselves to be patient with people as they find their new normal is is really important and understanding that there's good and bad that we want to remember so for me one of the great levelers has been I walk with a stick normally outside of the home not many people know that now because they haven't seen my legs not moving very well so it's really interesting for me I can feel quite normal and healthy in in lots of ways whereas an, an, underneath it all I'm probably not that normal and well, I'm definitely not normal but I'm not <laughs> healthy either <laughs> technically speaking although I feel it <laughs> Yeah, I just I think that is so true. And that has been one of the benefits is we've been able to recreate ourselves a little bit as to let people see what we want them to see. So, I mean, how many of us just as a really, really simple point, look smart from the waist up, but I've yeah. got my sweaty Betty leggings on and I'm as comfortable as anything. But, it, you know, you can show people I you know people don't need to know that I struggle with the tension of being a working mum and getting the kids and you know because no one needs to know that I've just ducked off because I haven't had to physically leave the office so it sort of allowed an element of recreating ourselves and the other reflection I had which I don't know about um you guys but I, generationally and I, if I group generation over you know several decades we none of us have had to um experience war or no. like any of these huge life-changing challenges but we've all known you know grandparents that have talked about it and it was this thing that had happened um or that they may have been very young or whatever but it was a life-changing event that people were never the same again after people talked about it for you know the next however many years and I think COVID's a bit like that for us it's going to be our first time there was a real fragility to and I'm not comparing it to war because obviously although actually in terms of the quantity of people that died it you know it it it, it probably should be held up next to war but it's um it the, the fragility of life that was shown to us where before everything had been quite okay and quite you could you could tackle anything and I think that's what will change us that it will be our equivalent of war it'll be the day that actually life became just that little bit more fragile and that little bit more precious yeah, okay, yeah absolutely um I think one of the things we've got to accept it's changed. I mean, and what, I've heard so many stories about the pendulum swinging back to the old norm, as it were, and suddenly everything's going to go back to normal. I just don't believe it will happen. I think the user or the staff now are much more empowered. I think one of the things I'm seeing and listening to more and more, talking to some of the leadership out there, is the leadership are having the same anxiety on the other way around. What are the, you know, can they demand their staffing? Can they, can they sort of say, right, we want to go back to a nine to five? 
And everything I'm hearing is, no, they need to be flexible. And that means they need coaching. They need help to understanding how to get with, you know, to with this new norm. Rav, there's a very good um, chance that a lot of these changes were happening anyway, and that it was it's, we've just sort of had a decade in a year of change. So with the technology like this, that means that there really is no logical reason why some of these roles, not all, but some of the roles can't be done remotely. I think we've just sped ourselves up a little yeah. bit. And um, Yeah, and, and just to add to that, Katie, the, the technology has leaps and bounds in three months. Yeah. Right. Zoom led the way and then you had Microsoft coming back with their teams in. And now it's like, you know, the things that if you think about where the budget always is, it's like, oh, yeah, what's the need? Oh, we've got to do this. This is not important enough. Right. What I've seen in Microsoft as well is certainly the focus is get this remote working working. Right. There's yeah. no questions about it. There's no question about how much. Just spend the money to get it done. Right. And I think you're right, Katie. You, we have had, I wouldn't say a decade, maybe. Certainly, I've been planning for five years to move the companies on, and they go, Yeah, yeah, no, we don't, can't spend money on that. And suddenly it's like, Go and get it done. We need it now. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. I'm a trustee for a small charity in Surrey, wonderful charity. Um, but they've probably seen more development in the last year than they have done in the last decade because needs must. And it's not just the um, video conferencing technology, is it? It's the data that sits behind it. It's the contracts that sit behind it. It's the the mindset and the culture. You know, if somebody had said, I've, you know, I've worked on large transformation company um, uh, programs in companies. If somebody had said, right, we have got to get our entire workforce, that includes, say, take a bank, banking staff working from home, and we've got to do it in three weeks. I mean, it would have just been hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been, you know, try three years or four. <laughs> Well, Whereas actually needs must. So, and again, going back to the war analogy, um, in both world wars, you saw a decade of innovation that came after that. Yeah. So, ever the optimist, the optimist in me believes that this will this will be a really really good thing in the longer term. We, it, obviously, we've we've suffered and struggled with it, but it will move us on in the right direction in a lot of these things. Um, uh, going back yeah. to, to, to work now, thinking of sort of supportive things we might want to encourage people to think about doing. One of the things I thought about was going back to basics a bit. So thinking about your Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Don't assume that everyone's got all their basic needs covered as they walk back through the door. Check in, you know, be human about it. Acknowledge that it's OK to say, well, actually, I've had a really bad time because a very close person to me died and I've been isolated and I've been very anxious and all sorts of things. Or people who come back in feeling very buoyant. What can they do to help others who, who maybe aren't in that place? Um, and teams reforming. They've got to go back a little bit and go through the reforming, that sort of truckman model of forming, storming and norming and then getting it right at the end. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, totally. I, I think it's a really good point. And the, the Maslow hierarchy of needs to totally agree with. And I think there's an element of meeting people where they are mm. on that. So not trying to assume that everybody is at the same place, just taking someone as you find them. I mean, certainly for me, I think one of the big changes that's um, I think I've just I feel much less in the rat race, much less worried about progression. Much I just I, I just want to enjoy my life and I want to work with really interesting people and do something that matters to me and um, and to the world at large. Um, and that will be the same for some people. It'll be different for others. So just kind of meeting people where they are and how they've changed and remembering as well. I think now that a lot of the shape of those teams will have changed. So yeah. some people have left, people have joined. I mean, we've got people in our business where they've never, ever met anyone face to face in the last year. They've been working for a year never met anyone face to face you know that's that's really hard for them to feel like the person on the periphery yeah uh, mel i think you've mentioned it before it's almost having you know when someone goes through a, a long absence whether it's um yeah. garden leave whether it's paternity or uh you know, paternity leave it's almost like everyone's been for long out for a long time yes you've been in contact but going back to the point you both made you really got to go back to zero you know zero and say assume nothing right help them i mean i've had people who were desperately conscious about going on the train because it's a very busy environment coming to the office once it's a controlled environment they've, they're relatively comfortable with right but it's that journey in you know can you stagger your times there's a lot of lot of um anxiety that people won't express unless you ask them 
yes yeah so being curious and being responsible if you're the leader in that team or the manager or the director or, or the senior t um, leadership team being inclusive to people um getting to see people where they're at and and maybe using things like coaching or like just mentoring to to bring people forwards and back into and and take the good that has happened with it and not lose it and, and progress onwards rather than keep yo-yoing backwards and forwards yeah Mel, one of the things i'd say is the senior management need to help the middle management i think there is you know it, it's it's all very well that everyone's struggling with this but if you think about how the middle manager or even the exec management to be honest some of the some of the people i talk to on the exec side of things it is like okay what is what, what should i do i want everyone in but should i or could i or not and i think that level of um support and i think you're right coaching whether it be executive coaching whether it be mentoring is to don't forget your leadership leader as well they're not going to pick it up by, by themselves just a slightly challenge on that i think that the almost the, there is no hierarchy on this is there like there's yeah. going to be like it's sort of it's not a problem to be solved by the top like the top might of the organization might sort of make the decisions a bit on the working from home practices etc but it's sometimes it's it's the reverse isn't it it's see i know I, I know senior leaders that have a real problem in opening up and creating a safe space for everybody to feel like they can talk about stuff so actually the role modeling may come from the middle of the organization it may come from anywhere in the organization um i think this is just untested uncharted territory for everybody and, may, and maybe that's that's a, a really helpful thing to kind of bring the discussion towards a conclusion on is that it has been a great leveler in many ways it has leveled some of the hierarchy and some of the control that we thought people had which they actually didn't have that, that a lot of assumptions had been made that everything would carry on as normal and life doesn't always do that um, and people aren't necessarily as disadvantaged as they were in some cases but in other cases there might be more so so let's let's go back to that let's try and help people bring the best out of themselves rather than put them under pressure to fit a certain model yeah and i think just on to a, kind of a, a closing thought would be that for me i don't think this is the end <laughs> now i think this has got a long way to play yeah. out both in terms of how people feel i don't mean necessarily covid but how people feel about this next stage of the journey and it, it doesn't feel like covid is done back to normal it feels like there's going to be a lot of trauma for people to come to terms with a lot of life decisions for people to make um it, it kind of is almost the beginning not the end in many ways yeah and i just like to sort of close in the fact that inclusion is a whole new step now you've got teams anywhere in the world. I, I remember a time when you re recruited within a certain um, distance from the office. I've seen people recruit anywhere because location doesn't matter so much because the technology makes up for that. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. It's been really interesting listening to you. I'll pay you later. No, I won't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to seeing everyone again next month for our next Let's Talk Mental Health. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thank you.